Greetings and welcome to another episode of Stanford Cinema. As always, I am your host. My name is Andrew. Thank you very much for downloading this latest episode. We've got a really, really great episode in store for you. How many times can I say episode? Um, we're going to be covering the 1975 spy thriller, Three Days of the Condor, directed by Sidney Pollock and starring Robert Redford, Faye Dunaway, Max Van Cedal. What else do you need to know? It's freaking awesome. If you haven't seen it, definitely do so. I think it's aged rather well, especially in the light of our current political climate. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to chat about this movie. And the guest that recommended it is a really, really interesting writer. I'm I'm excited to bring him on here, find out a little bit more about his work, uh, let him share it with us. And uh, yeah, he has a brand new book that just came out. So this is going to be a really fun conversation. But enough of the yapping. Let's bring him on out, right? Please welcome to the show, Mr. John Bukowski. Again, John, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to be on the show. How are you doing? God, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Always happy to talk about one of my favorite thriller movies, Three Days of the Condor. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into that with you. But before we start doing that, I want to know a little bit more about you, where you live, what do you do, how a movie like this pops up on your radar, you know, et cetera, things like that. So, John, if you wouldn't mind for the listeners, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, originally a Motown boy from Detroit, but I've lived in New Jersey and Southern Ohio. And right now I'm in eastern Tennessee, uh, not about 30 miles from Knoxville. And uh, my background is a little bit different. Um uh, I was a science track my whole uh, career in school, uh, went on and got a doctor of veterinary medicine degree, practiced in Michigan for about seven years, uh, left from that and went to do research in public health and got a doctorate in that, public health epidemiology. And uh, through all that time, I was doing research and I was writing. And I found that more and more, I wrote more and more, people wanted me to write more and more, and I enjoyed the writing more than the research. So I branched off when I got done with uh, corporate crap, I branched <laughs> off to uh, <clears throat> do contract medical writing. And around the time of the Great Recession, uh, some business dried up, so I had time. I had always been a very avid reader, lover of novels, thriller novels, sci-fi, horror, and uh, decided to write a book. And I wrote a, uh, a thriller, and it's still in a drawer somewhere. Uh, and uh, about 10 years later, and uh, a bunch of rejections, I got my first novel published, Project Suicide. I'll, right here's an hey. example. And uh, that's been out for a couple of months and uh, really enjoying promoting that. And I'm writing, working on other books right now. But uh, that's what I'm doing as of this moment. I love that. Now, just for just for clarity, just so I, may, I understand correctly. So Project Suicide, that was your first novel that was published? Yes. My debut novel. I've got about eight short stories that have been published, uh, but that was the first novel. It's 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 a fun read. It's a story of how a cure for Alzheimer's disease is perverted into an assassination drug. Mm. Now, high profile politicians are killing themselves and only a drunken genius can save the country. And that, that's so, a pretty damn good elevator <laughs> pitch right there. I got to tell you. Yeah, that's what they call the log line. Well, I'm excited. I'm going to definitely check that out. So um Great. So you said that's only been out for just a couple months now? That's been out a couple of months. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it at other bookstores through Ingram. Uh, easiest way is just to go to www.projectsuicidenovel.com. Take it right to Amazon. I have to ask, just as somebody that also really enjoys to write, what was that that feeling when when basically a publisher is like, yeah, let, let's do this. And then you then you see it right there. I mean, it's, it's a literal like pages in front of you now, like in novel form, like, like what's yeah. that pride, like emotional, like experience well, that you have with well, that? It, it, it obviously feels great uh, because, you know, you've gone, all writers go through lots of rejection. Uh, I think it was Stephen King who said, get yourself a, a, a spike 
and put your rejection notices on it. And when that gets filled, get yourself a new spike for rejection notices. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, you go through a lot of rejection. And uh, uh, when when somebody says, yeah, this is good. This is one of the best things I've read uh, coming to my desk. Then you feel kind of vindicated. Mm-hmm. And that's the feedback I'm getting from people that have read the book as well, that they've really enjoyed it. Lots of twists and turns, uh, likable characters, all good stuff. Well, I'm, I'm really excited for you. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Now, were there like what type of influences do you have? I mean, obviously, all of us creatively, I mean, we, you know, we have our own brains, certainly, but there are those that have helped shape us and you know, uh, turn us into the writers that we are. So who are some of the influences that you've had coming, you know, coming through, coming through the well, years? My big three, I mean, I've, I've liked a lot of authors from Tolkien to Ray Bradbury and what have you, but my big three have been probably uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway. Mm. I mean, the man revolutionized American writing and had a larger than life life. Um, I've read most of his stuff. Uh, Stephen King, the master, I think, of character. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons his horror novels are so successful is he makes you love the characters before he does stuff to them. Right. (laughs) And the third one, Elmore Leonard, the man's the master of uh, dialogue. You probably know Get Shorty Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Jackie Brown, which was based on one of his books, Rum Punch. Yep. And uh, m- most of his books have been uh, filmed one way or the other. So, yeah, for him for dialogue. Yeah. All three of those writers are just absolute bangers. I mean, just the work that they've created. The obviously, I mean, uh, my own personal tastes, I I've been reading Stephen King since well before I should have started reading Stephen King. Right, right, right. Uh, my introduction to uh, to. Uh, oh, my God. Um Old Man in the Sea. Ernest Hemingway. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ernest Hemingway. You know, uh, my introduction to him was, I think, it would have been like the summer of seventh grade. Like it was on like the reading list. All right, before we start eighth grade, make sure you read right, Old Man right, in the Sea. So right. that was my introduction to him. And then, of course, Elmore Leonard. It wouldn't. It wasn't until 1996 when, uh, you know, uh, ja- uh, I'm sorry, when Get Shorty came out, and it was it, it was based on his work, and that that's when I was introduced to him and. Yeah, all three of those those writers are just absolutely incredible. Yeah, I actually started reading Elmore Leonard in the mid two thousands with his uh, westerns. Oh. Some of my, a couple of my favorite westerns uh, were uh, movies, were Ombre with Paul Newman, and then uh, Valdez is coming with Burt Lancaster. And I saw those were Elmore Leonard books, and I knew he read he wrote gritty crime drama, you know, crime novels. But I said, huh, I didn't know he wrote Westerns. That's what he started with. So I started reading his Westerns and got hooked and I've read all but I think two of his books. Uh, so, yeah, he's he's one of my favorites. Like I said, if you want to know dialogue, read Elmore Leonard. For sure. For sure. Uh, just because, again, like I you mentioned Stephen King. And I, I it, It's in my nature. I have to pause. I have I have to kind of uh, segue and talk a little bit about him. But do you have a favorite Stephen King novel? Oh, I like a lot of them. I'll tell you one I really love that no one talks about, and it's not that big. It's not like a, it's only like a 350 word novel. It's called Joyland. And I have not, it's, I've not read Joyland. It's one of his hard case crime novels. Oh. And mm-hmm. it basically takes place uh, a guy reminiscing about the summer he worked at a carnival down in, I think it's South Carolina or something like that, a big, you know, midway t- style carnival. And uh, it's, it incorporates some supernatural into it, a crime, uh, a lot of uh, kind of teen angst or, or early college angst. Really, really effective, I thought. I've, I've read it several times. Nice. I, I only just started reading Later, which was a book that, I don't know, it just came out fairly recently. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. So, I read but, that. But I'm definitely gonna check out Joyland. So thank you very much for for uh, for referencing that because yeah, I I haven't read uh, everything that he's done. But yeah, obviously, uh, it, it Salem's Lot, The Shining, all great. You know, mm-hmm. that's very. 
Now, in the beginning, did I hear correctly that you had a background? You said, was it veterinarian work or? Yeah, I, I was a practicing veterinarian in southeastern Michigan near Detroit for about seven years. And probably around the time I did my thousandth use in Asia, which is an unfortunate part of the job. I said, you know, maybe I want to try something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I said, well, let's look behind what causes diseases. And that's when I got into public health research. Epidemiology, which I, thanks oh. to COVID, I don't have to explain to people, is not skin doctor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exciting. Now, doctor. obviously, you said you mentioned Motown. So you're from, from the Michigan area. Yeah. Uh, favorite 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 song out of the the whole like Motown movement or favorite artist oh god I would maybe Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band oh okay okay you know it's uh he's not really Motown he's not like uh Martha and the Vandellas or something like that right. uh or uh but he's certainly that Detroit sound right all right well John Thank you very much for just introducing the listeners a little bit too about you. But the meat and potatoes of today's discussion is obviously getting into the film that you had referenced a little bit before, which is Three Days of the Condor. Again, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for recommending that title. I mean, uh, as I said before we started recording, I had seen this movie years ago. It, I think when by years ago, like a couple decades ago, I think in my 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 tween years, I went through this Robert Redford phase where right, right. like TBS and TNT, I think, went through a Robert Redford phase where they were showing everything from, you know, whether it was Butch Cassidy to to this film to shoot Legal Eagles in the 1980s. Right. right? Like right. the or even the natural. Right. Like all these Robert right. Redford films. But I'm really I'm really curious to know why did you want to talk about Three Days of the Condor? Well, it's one of my favorite thrillers. And uh, as you know, I mean, I write thrillers. I've, I've read a lot of thrillers. And uh, I have maybe a half a dozen thriller movies from around that time that I go back to and watch at least once a year. One of them is Day of the Jackal. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is Dogs of War, which is a kind of a war thriller kind of deal. Uh, Charade with, uh, with uh, Cary Grant. Uh, Mirage with uh, with uh, uh, Gregory Peck, mm. Topaz, and Three Days of the Condor. And so for me, it was just a natural one of those. I think I threw out a couple of those to you and you mm -hmm. jumped on Three Days of the Condor. So, I mean, that certainly works for me. I just yeah, watched yeah. it a couple of days ago. I love the 1970s feel of it. It's around the time of Watergate. People are distrusting the government. We've learned that the CIA was involved in the uh, ZM assassination in Vietnam, that they were involved with Allende's overthrow in Chile. Uh, a lot of this stuff is playing into the paranoia of the public. Uh, so the, the Joe Turner coming back from lunch and finding everybody dead, I mean, that's just, that's perfect. People bought that right away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if it's the CIA, man. Yeah, I'm 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 intrigued. Obviously, you know, th this movie came out a couple of years before I was born. So the whole idea of not trusting the government, not really trusting government agencies is really just I mean, quite frankly, something that I've known my entire life. Right. And many people that are born today, that, that that's all they've ever known. And obviously we had Watergate in what was it, 72? And then yeah, well, 70, I think Watergate broke around 73, 74, and okay. Nixon resigned around 75, something mm -hmm. like that. So yeah. And then yeah. McCarthyism, which like precedes that, but still the right. whole idea of right. like, the Red Scare, right? Just if right. I'm going back through like American history correctly. So we started seeing films about that idea kind of like pop up starting really in the 60s. And yeah. then obviously, really in the the 1940s and 1950s, we had the whole like code so there were certain things that they they would they would they would talk about certain things that they wouldn't talk about but in the 1970s we started to see like cinematic like auteurs really kind of like take over and we started to see the rise of really interesting cinema of whether it was crime whether it was spy whether it was espionage or shit whether it was mafia right so we right, started right. to see this this different culmination of films that that came into the front and 
you know, this movie came out in 1975. A year later, I think like all the president's men came out. Right, and, right, right. You know, but you had all the like all these films that were coming out in this time. And what I like about going through the the re the rewatch of Three Days of the Condor is, yeah, obviously not trusting the government. But what I like is fast forward forty some odd years, the movie still. It holds up well. I mean, I think most elements of the film hold up well. I, I don't I don't know how much I'm in love with the love story of this. I, I would say I would say the, that's my biggest flaw, too, is that. And I don't if I as I recall, it wasn't in the book Six Days of the Condor. But the the, the love story, the the hostage becoming his lover, like almost overnight. Right. You know, I, I think that strains credulity a little bit. I would agree that that is probably the least interesting part of the movie. Right. Before we get our head before we get ahead of ourselves, for those that haven't seen this film, would you mind giving kind of like a cliff notes version of what this movie is about? Sure. It's uh uh Joe Turner, who's played by Robert Redford, works for a CIA front organization which is called a literary society. And they read books and they look for anything within books, fiction, uh, nonfiction, what have you, that the CIA could use either in their operations or signs that people may be becoming familiar with their operations or whatever. And they enter them into computers and that's what they do all day. And Joe Turner is uh, one of the readers. You can tell uh, that he's very intelligent. They introduce that with uh, some of this dialogue. And one day it's raining and he has to go for lunch. So he doesn't go out the front door. He runs out the back because it's quicker. And while he's at lunch, a group of assassins come in and kill everybody in the building. And he comes back from lunch and he looks at the people and goes, what, what's going on? You know, and these people are just lying down in the in the lobby. And now he's on the run. Mm -hmm. And it's the whole story of who's behind it. And will they get him? Will he find out who's behind it and stop them first? Uh, some very interesting villains, an assassin named Jobert, who's very interesting, my favorite character. And uh, uh, it's just a thrill ride from that moment on. And what a great premise. The guy goes out for lunch. And just by the, that quirk he's spared and he's the only one mm -hmm. i also love it was a, a fun little bit of exposition as to because we and, and i'm not going to spoil this movie because obviously you know this it, it, it's a fun ride and i think i think a lot of my listeners um might not necessarily have seen this movie even though you know it's been around for 40 years but I'm not going to spoil this movie, but I do love that little subtle bit of exposition in that yeah, I'm going to go out the back way because it's faster. Right. And by that definition, because we saw our already like when he goes in, there's somebody just kind of like crossing right. off names of who's going into the building. Right. And he wants, he's got, OK, I've got everybody in the building mm -hmm. and nobody comes out the front. So they must still be in there. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the the scene in, I don't know, like the, the diner deli is like low key. One of my favorite scenes. I, I, I love the real uh, kind of like conversation that takes place between yeah. Robert Redford and the guy there and a couple of the patrons that are in there. Uh, really funny, just like talking about books and just it, it, it's kind of, I don't know, a form of levity within this movie because there, right. there isn't a lot. There isn't a ton of humor in this film, but that moment, there's some really good levity that yeah. I think works well in the film. Right. And another thing that that moment and several of them of the scenes in the movie, they're a good example of show, don't tell. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you that Turner's a real smart guy, but he's talking to the guy in the deli. And these facts, historical facts, are just flying off the tip of his brain. Mm -hmm. And the guy goes, wow, this is a very intelligent man. You know, and that's all that you know from that. That's just a smart guy. Yeah. You know, you yeah. don't have to see any diplomas or anything like that. Yeah. 
and not necessarily juxtaposed, but the the simple the simple reality is, I mean, we see a relatively young Robert Redford who's in in jeans and a tweed jacket and uh, not quite disheveled hair, but very very seventies blonde, right. beautiful blonde locks, and you know right. he's a likable dude. But there's more to him than this guy that's just riding riding like a moped to work or whatever, right? right? And, and but and. So yeah, you you do again that that show don't tell, but we we get a little bit deeper inside into into who he is, which yeah, again, it just it, it's a really cool subtle scene that that I enjoyed that scene more than the scene in the CIA, even though that's good where they're right. they're saying who he is, his background, right. Right. which that's spelling out exposition. Right. Um, it's still good because we find out oh there he is a lot more. Than that meets the eye, but I think we all we we truly get that sense in that diner scene, which I think works even better than the CIA scene where they're trying to figure out well maybe he's a double agent, right? Well, in the CIA scene too, also uh, um, Higgins was played by uh, um, Cliff Robertson. He uh, he says. Uh, Basically, they go, well, how does he know this or that or the other thing? And he goes, he reads. He reads everything. He reads Which everything. is a way of saying he reads it, retains it, and can use it. So, mm-hmm. he's again, we see he's a smart guy. You know, he reads everything, but you everybody could read stuff. It's being able to then retain it and apply it, mm-hmm. which he's able to do. You see that later with some uh, of the phone scenes and stuff like that. Yeah. Now, John, when did you first see Three Days of the Condor? When did I first see it? Probably either when it came out or not long after, you know, 75, 76, something like that. Uh, either I saw it in the movies or I saw it when it was first available on TV. Because remember back in the day, we didn't have uh, we didn't have DV, DVRs and we didn't have uh, cable. It was the three stations when they decided to show a movie. You watched it when it was on. And uh, so, yeah, probably ABC or CBS had it on Saturday night or something like that. And I probably saw it then if I didn't see it in the theater. Like, this seems like an obvious question, and I apologize for asking it. But I think I think it's a good conversational piece. So why do you feel that this movie is still relevant even today? Well, number one, it's a it's a well-made film. I mean, Sidney Pollack's a wonderful director. The acting is all top notch. Like I said, Joe Bear, played by Max von Sydow, I think is just a fantastic character. And the script, again, I'm, I'm as a writer, I'm very attuned to the scripts. The dialogue is crisp. The there's not a lot of wasted material. Uh, I, I I think it it holds together just because cinematically it's a very good movie. Mm-hmm. And certainly we haven't lost our distrust of the government. So. Uh, uh, that's still relevant. And like I said, people people can buy into that, I think, fairly easily. Thematically, is there anything that kind of stands out to you that that because, I mean, before we started talking, you had mentioned that you've seen this movie like 50 times. Right. right? Exactly. So like, I mean, so is it is it just the acting or is it just the directing, which, by the way, both are fantastic. You mentioned Redford, you mentioned Cliff Robertson, you mentioned Max Van Cedal, who one of my favorite all-time actors. Yeah, very uh, good. Certainly, like, in the 1970s, uh, you know, like this and Marathon Man and, you know, just, right. just some of the stuff that he, that he had he had done. Um, Faye Dunaway, who, again, is, oh, yeah. is, is incredible, which we haven't, we've been chatting for about 20 minutes and haven't even mentioned Faye Dunaway. Right. But, you know, are there any, like, specific themes that, that as a, a writer that's done kind of crime that, that you kind of latch on to you that that connect and is part of the reason why you've watched this like 50, 60 times. I think one of the one of the things are uh, the characters. Uh, I mentioned Joubert, which I like a lot. And there's a lot of show don't tell with Joubert as well, revealing about him. But the Joe Turner character is very good. Uh I would actually say Deacon Creel, my protagonist from Project Suicide. I had Joe Turner in the back of my mind, not mm-hmm. right up front, but in the back of my mind. He's kind of 
a guy who doesn't give a crap about a lot of things, very laid back, uh, but smart, uh, can apply what he knows, resourceful, has an inner strength when he's put to the uh, put the spurs to him as it is by uh, by the story. Uh, he's able to think on his feet and stuff. So I like that a lot. I mean, the theme is basically the main theme is distrust the government. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think that's pretty clear. But uh, uh, yeah, it's the characters that more than anything, Cliff Robertson's character, which is wonderful, the dyed in the wool company man, the company in the uh, in the in the um, figuratively and actually the company. And, uh, you know, you can really relate to his character. A lot of people coming out of the 1950s when they did trust the government a lot more. I mean, if you watch the old sci-fi movies, uh, the government's the hero, you mm-hmm. know, the army, the the FBI, the CIA, whatever. Uh, so coming out of that era, he would be a staunch company man. And that's molded him as much as anything. So I think... I think the characters, more than anything, to me, uh, make it live and still be uh, still be fun to watch, even after all this time. Totally, totally. Now, are there obviously the the movie from start to finish is really good. Uh, a couple things that I love is even though there is music in the movie, what I love and you, you saw this a lot. You don't see it. I don't think you see it nearly as much, but is the use of like diegetic sounds. So just the audio that, for right. example, when like the computer was like, you're, you're just listening to that. There's no music going right. on within it. So just <laughs> natural sounds. <laughs> right. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Very uh, like natural over, sounds. Yeah. A lot yeah. of diegetic noise, which I think, you know, just again, the, the world within this is very specific. And just within a little bit of research, we also, the, the novel, from what I understand, was basically took entirely in D.C., where this one took place completely in New York. And right. you're just seeing a 1970s New York. But I bring all of that to circle back. You know, are there favorite scenes or favorite moments in the film that you that you want to kind of like unpack at all? Yeah, the again, a lot of those come back to scenes with Javert or excuse me, mm-hmm. Jobert, mm-hmm. not Javert, that's lame as rough, but Jobert. Um, he's such a great villain. And we see, again, we aren't told, but we are shown that he is very much not only a professional at what he does, being an assassin, a hired gun, but he's at peace with it. He's very compartmentalized. There's a a scene in the beginning where he is, the other guys are running around to, to find the other people upstairs, and he's standing at the desk and he pulls one of the uh, women he's just killed cigarettes out. He's looking for a lighter. You know, he's he's totally relaxed. Uh, the, the, the biggest example of that is probably there's a scene where, you know, he's hunting for Condor and he's going to kill him. And uh, they close up on him. He's painting little lead soldiers with music playing in the, you know, uh, classical music playing in the background. The man's totally at ease with what he does. Yep. He's uh, he's in the elevator with uh, Condor, and he's going to kill him shortly. Yep. And he's just chatting with him about kids. And is this your glove? I found this on the floor, you know. And uh, yeah, we know more about him than if he, they, we we you know we had three pages of of uh, script related to how thorough he was or whatever. Right, right. And uh, just to like piggyback, just because you had mentioned Condor, for those that hadn't seen it, Condor is the like the code name of, the code of Turner. Name for Joe Turner, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. A um, couple, qu- uh, couple quick questions, and then I want to put you on the hot seat, ask you a couple trivia questions just to see okay. how well you really know this movie. All right. But um, just because. You know, American history is something that that I'm intrigued by and certainly things that happened before I was around. But, you know, obviously somebody that that was around with when Watergate happened, do you remember? Because we live in like a 24 hour news cycle. So when things happen, 
we know at that moment, right. whether it's on TV or whether it's somebody's tweeting it at that moment. But where were you when water broke uh, when Watergate broke out to you? I was in, I would probably say my middle high school years at the time. And I remember when the hearings started, and that was, it, I don't know if it was 24-7, but that was where basically that's what the networks had on for, you know, much of the day was the Watergate hearings. And I remember watching them and the John Dean and Ehrlichman and uh, uh, all the different, Sam Rayburn and all the different uh, political figures that were around. So, yeah, that was that was close to the 24 hour news cycle that we have now mm -hmm. with that. And at first, you know, people wanted to believe the best of government just as they had in years past. And over time, it became obvious that there was something else going on here. Now, today, if, if you actually took what Nixon did today or to be back then and put it today, it might not be that big a deal. <laughs> right. right. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody died. There was a, a botched burglary. Uh, he may not have even known about it, but he did try to cover it up. And this was a major deal. Uh, you know, so uh, so, yeah, it was a little bit disillusioning for a lot of people. Uh, because, you know, they had been taught to trust government and they believed uh, political leaders when they said something. You know, this was before the blue dress and all that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is there anything else that you want to kind of like cover before I have some fun trivia questions for you? Uh, no, just with, uh, like I said, with, with Condor, I, I, all the, all the scenes that I remember the most, well, uh, a lot of them have Jobert in them, mm -hmm. but there's my favorite scene is probably when the mailman comes to oh, the mailman the scene. Apartment. Yeah. When the mailman comes to the apartment, it's so nicely cut together how he lets him in because it's the guys incrementally letting him in. You have to sign. The pen doesn't work. I don't have another pen. I'll get one. Then he steps in, you know, and Turner's, they cutting back and forth, figuring out exactly when he realizes that this is not a mailman, you know, and then the, and after that, it's just nonstop action for like two minutes of just constant fighting and action. So, I mean, yeah, that's that, really well put together. Scene. Yeah, that that scene was very reminiscent to it was very Hitchcockian, that scene. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Very, very Hitchcockian. And. I I came across a an interview uh, I think with Sidney Pollack and he was asked if if uh, he was influenced by by Alfred Hitchcock and he's like not really you know like I had seen right. Psycho but you know it, it it was just just kind of like one of those kind of like obvious kind of way to tell good drama but even if you don't necessarily know it. I mean, it does have those very like Alfred Hitchcock kind of right. vibe, and I, th and I think they are, were all influenced by him to to a greater or lesser degree, whether they mm -hmm. know it or not. And all yeah. the directors back then. All right, John. Here we go. I've got I've got a couple questions. The first one I was going to ask, what is the 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 last name of our central character? But you already know that's Turner. So we're going to move on to another question. At the start of the film. The Condor and his associates are expecting a response to a report he recently submitted. What was the subject of the report? This, it's the subject, the thing that gets it going is a report about a novel that didn't sell, but that was translated into a bunch of languages and not like French, where you think would be a, a common language, or Chinese, but uh, Dutch mm -hmm. and Spanish and a bunch of languages that he can't figure out. And he's he's noodling with the people there, like his, his girlfriend, Janice. Uh, why did this novel that didn't sell get translated so much, which is an expensive proposition? 
And that is kind of the thing that is gnawing at him in the beginning. And it kind of becomes the revelation later when he figures it out. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Absolutely correct. Uh, <laughs> question number two, where, do, where does Turner meet Kathy Hale? Meets her at a store. She's buying ski gear. And that's a scene I love just because it's reminiscent. She hands over a credit card and the guy has to call up the credit card company to verify that the account is good. And that's what we had to do. Uh, I mean, I didn't have a credit card probably until I was 30, 35, something like that. And uh, it was a pain in the ass to use <laughs> because you had to wait. And the phone lines were often jammed. And sometimes they got where they had these big books of numbers and they would check against fraudulent numbers, you know, to see if it was if it was a good number. But that was back in the day when that's how you used a credit card. I think that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that insight. Um, my, my next question, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm just kind of chuckling that that's just it, it's just wild to think about that. And in the lens of, of today versus when right. you, you got your first credit card and everything. Um, what was the, I mean, this is an easy one, but what was in the newspaper that Condor uh, gave his story to? Oh, New York Times. New York Times. I wasn't sure, you know, some people might think the Washington Post, uh, but, I was, you know. Um, okay, so the final question that I've got for you, it, it's not necessarily so much related specifically to the film, but the our, our star, Robert Redford. And I ask this because... Robert Redford is so, well, so awesome, but so specifically, like, career-wise tied to uh, Paul Newman, right? right. They had, obviously, they were in Butch Cassidy, Sundance Kid, and they were in The Sting. Were they in another film together? I, don't I think that was it. Okay. But for whatever reason, they're, they're just universally linked in kind of the way that the Beatles and Elvis are linked as far as... Are you a Beatles person or are you Elvis person? Right, right, right. So my question for you is, are, I mean, and it's okay to like them both, but boom, you have to draw a line. Are you team Redford or are you team Paul Newman? I would probably say Paul Newman. One of my favorite films of all time is The Hustler. Mm -hmm. Paul Newman, which I think he does a fantastic job. George C. Scott does a phenomenal job. You know, Piper Laurie, the whole, well, Jackie Gleason, everybody. But a lot of his movies... Uh, Long Hot Summer, uh, even movies like The Young Philadelphians, and uh, certainly Harper Hud. I love I love uh, Harper. That's uh, that's a great detective. Cool movie. Hand Luke. Cool Hand Luke. Uh, all the movies that uh, Ombre, all the movies that he did in the in the sixties. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm I, Red, Redford's good. Uh, his favorite thing of his is that I that I love is actually he directs it is uh ordinary people mm -hmm. you know that's one of my favorite movies of all time and uh but yeah he was he's very good and, I've, and i'm seeing even his early stuff like uh situation was it situation something but not serious situation terrible but not serious or something like that oh, was right. kind of service comedy that he did about world war ii and and uh so i've seen a lot of his movies most of his movies too but and I like them both, but Paul Newman, yeah. That that seems to typically be the 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 more popular like choice. I, and I, I don't again, I don't think there's really a wrong answer, but I think majority of people can tend to side on on Paul Newman. It's kind of hard not to. Although again, I do love I do love me some Robert Redford. Um, I think I think the first Robert Redford film that I saw was would have been The Natural. Because I, you know, just grew up and I think when I discovered baseball at like seven years old, you know, then it became watching all the baseball movies that I could I could get my right, hands on. Right. Um, where I admittedly I wasn't I didn't discover Paul Newman until I don't know, like maybe 10 or 11. I knew he was an actor. Right. He, he was a salad dressing guy as far as I as far as I knew. Um, well, but, some, of his, some of his movies in the 80s, too, like Color of Money. Oh and yeah. Mm -hmm. One of my one of my personal favorites is uh uh Absence of Malice. Uh, oh, right. That uh, those those are just really wonderful films. 
you know, it's funny just because you mentioned the color of money. I think that was the first Paul Newman film that I actually saw. And that would have been because Tom Cruise, who right. was just the big name at that moment. And it was about like hustling and pool. And yeah, so would have saw that as a kid. But, um, you know, John, I've had a really, really fun time, you know, just talking about this movie. One, going back to look at a movie that I hadn't seen in quite some time to get your take on it. Obviously, to speak to somebody completely new, shout out to the podcast guests website, which is great just to be able to introduce people and be able to talk about different experiences. Now, if people uh, you, you mentioned at the outside, but just to kind of go back to it, you've got you've got you've got a new book out. Right. Um, and it's available. But where where again can people find it? Easiest way to do it is uh, get it off of Amazon. Go to www.projectsuicidenovel, all one word, dot com. It'll take you right to the Amazon page. It's available in Kindle, very reasonable uh, paperback and hardcover. <clears throat> and uh, I hope people buy it. I hope they like it. And I hope they leave a review because that's kind of an important thing, uh, not only for for new readers, uh, people who might buy the book, they go by reviews. And Amazon, where they place you, is based on uh numbers and and quality reviews so that's important wonderful wonderful again thank you so much uh thank you. yeah my it was my are you kidding it was my pleasure and you mentioned um some other films so shoot john if you ever want to come back and talk about another movie oh absolutely just, just any time to talk about films with you i think would just be an absolute treat i've had such a great time just going through this movie and yeah so keep you, me you can, keep me on you your can radar see behind me over here that's just the bottom part of that bookshelf is just some of my DVDs. Uh, I've got them in a couple other shelves around here. There's like 700 titles. That's a lot of movies. That's a lot of movies. <laughs> what are you, what are you watching these days? Are you, you know, obviously you've got the, the hard, you know, you've got the actual like DVDs and whatnot. Right. What are, you know, is there anything that you're, that you're watching currently or anything that you're binging these days? Um, Nothing right now. We we uh, a while back we binge Justified, mm. uh, which is uh, again an Elmore Leonard uh, yeah story, Elmore Leonard characters, which uh, very entertaining and 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 very very good. Um, Stephen King's Eleven Twenty Two uh, Sixty Three. Right, we watched that uh, not that long ago, and that's like eight episodes or nine episodes or something like that. Very good, uh, but. I, I watch a lot of Turner Classic movies. I mm -hmm. watch a lot of uh, uh, the different free services. I don't I don't pay a lot for movies uh, except the ones I own. And I uh, just watched The Godfather today, which I hadn't seen in a little while. Uh, that's, I think, the greatest movie of all time. So, I mean, it, it's hard to argue unless you say maybe <laughs> Godfather 2. But, I, um, you know, like. But certainly, I, I put Godfather one and two. Definitely, I don't know. I don't know where I rank them. I don't know where I rank them. But I put both of them somewhere in the top ten for yeah. sure. They very well could be one and two. I don't know. It, it's it's almost impossible for me to. When when people say what's your favorite movie, I'm like, Ugh. I'm just gonna usually say the movie I've seen the most. Because right. when I get try to get analytical as far as what I think is really best, I can't answer it. So it's yeah. easy for me to say what like what are some of my favorite films. Right. It, it, it's like, well, favorite, what type of movie? Mm -hmm. you know, exactly. Favorite, favorite little movie, you know, small budget surprise, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, uh, favorite bad person. movie, too. Right. <laughs> favorite bad movie, favorite Western, favorite sci-fi, favorite horror. You know, it's it's there's so many genres. It's like uh, uh, impossible to pick one. That is, you know better than all the others but if i had to do it under gunpoint it would be godfather yeah definitely one of the greats i i try to go back and see the godfather once every few years just because it it, it, it it's perfect and i may have seen godfather 2 a little bit more uh just because my heart always kind of breaks a little bit when sunny is just so unceremoniously like just torn to shreds right. Um, there is actually but, uh, some, something they did a few years ago, which I think you can get on DVD. I've been thinking of doing it called uh, The Godfather, a novel for television. And they took Godfather one and two and they edited them 
chronologically. So it starts with oh. the young Vito coming in from, and uh, it goes all the way through to the end of Godfather 2, and they added some extra scenes and stuff. So the whole thing's like seven hours long. I remember seeing it when it was on TV back in the 80s, I'm thinking. And huh. it was really fun. It was different. I'm going to definitely check that out. My mother had told me, not, I don't have Paramount Plus, but apparently there was a, there's a show on there that that is about the making of the Godfather. Yeah, the making of yeah. the Godfather. Somebody, yeah, somebody recommended that to me too. I haven't seen it. Yet. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm gonna look into that. If I may make a recommendation, it might be a little bit out your comfort zone, but it still kind of ties into the whole idea of like crime. Right. Uh, this is kind of like a crime comedy. It's out now. But if I could recommend a title to you, I, I want to recommend the movie Vengeance. Okay, uh, which I think I think you might enjoy. Okay. I think you might enjoy it. it. It's a little little has a little bit more comedy to it. But what the the filmmaker uh, he's an actor. He actually was on The Office for years. His name is B J Novak. But okay. he's he's a writer as well. He was one of the writers on there. But uh, it, it's a it's it's still a crime story and it's really good. It's out in some theaters now. It'll probably be available for streaming in the near future, but I'll check take a look at that. I think you might enjoy that. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Again, John, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was so much fun. Thank I had a great time yeah. chatting with you. I always like to talk movies. Wonderful. Will you take care? And oh, what's next? What, you know, obviously, obviously talking about the, the current novel, I, but well, you know, I, what's, just, what's next? I just sent to the publisher a uh, uh, final draft of the next book, which is, uh, it's not a sequel, although I'm working on a sequel to Project Suicide, but it's called Checkout Time. And it's the story of an extortion bomber who's trying to get money from a consortium of hotels by bombing their hotels. And say, oh, I bombed your hotel and I'll pay me or I'll bomb another one. And it's just bad luck for him that the very first bombing is on the same floor where a beautiful FBI agent and a handsome government researcher who specializes in commercial fires is are, sleep, are on the same floor. So they become involved in the search for uh, the, the bad guy who is known mysteriously as Conrad Hilton. And uh, they're trying to find him and he's trying to get them. And so we've got a whole lot of that going on as it goes up and down I-75 between Tennessee and Ohio. And a lot of fun stuff, a lot of uh, uh, twists and turns. That I, I mean, again, log line and the whole plot somewhere right there. I'm, I'm hooked. I, I want to know what happens <laughs> to that story. So I think you're, I think you're on to something. So uh, good luck with Thanks. that one. Thanks. But definitely going to check out Project Suicide. So thank you very much for for talking about that. And um, all right, again, thank you. Take care. Once again, thank you so much to John for for hopping on the show. I had a incredible time uh, talking about the movie, finding out more about his book. I know he's got another book that will be coming out at some point. So seems like everything's coming up Millhouse for John, right? Uh, again, this would not be possible without everybody that takes the time to download this podcast. I'm extremely, extremely thankful for anybody that hits play. It means the world. And uh, so if you are a listener, if you are a subscriber, please take a minute to, you know, I don't know, uh, leave a review, like, subscribe, all that stuff. But leaving a review is really, really important. It helps us grow our base. And if you don't know how to do that, you know, um, you can always visit my website, stampercinema.com. There's literally a tab that says review and you can leave a review right from my website too. But if you're listening on your podcast and you've got the little app there, Click on more information on this and go to those show notes so you can find out, you know, my various links. Uh, also, I'll have detailed information so you can find out John's links um, for for his for his work. And of course, I'll have some information on the movie that we just watched. So the show notes definitely delve in a little bit more stuff behind the surface that things that we uncover. Again, just trying to make this uh, this experience for everybody as enjoyable as possible, right? I mean, that is the game plan. I know I'm kind of ranting and raving, but I had just a couple notes. One, I wanted to encourage you to leave a review. Two, I wanted to encourage you to check out the website. Three, obviously send massive shout outs and thank yous to, to John and definitely check out his book. It sounds really freaking intriguing, right? 
So I think that is about all I'm going to say for now. But we will catch you on the next one. Thank you again.